Welcome to the Physique Development Muscle Series. In this special series, we're breaking down the science and art of training each muscle group. Each episode is dedicated to a specific muscle, providing you with expert insight into its function, dispelling common training misconceptions, and highlighting our go-to exercises that deliver results. We'll also share key execution cues to help you perfect your technique and maximize your gains. Get ready to elevate your training game and achieve your fitness goals like never before. Let's dive into arms. This next guest has been a longtime friend and an extremely impressive academic with his Bachelor of Science in Athletic Training, his Master's of Science in Exercise and Nutrition. He's also a certified trainer, a certified sports nutritionist, and currently an adjunct professor and human performance researcher at the University of Tampa. Whew. Welcome, Chris Bearcat. Chris has been immersed in all things building muscle and losing fat and has world-renowned research on those topics. His primary interest is in optimizing body composition outcomes and athletic performance, and he is constantly aiming to improve and grow as a coach. On top of all that, Chris is a professional natural bodybuilder, a father, and a husband. Chris knows quite a bit about building big arms himself and helping others do it too. Welcome to the show. Chris, it is amazing to have you on. I have been excited for this episode for us to really dig into all things arm training because I I have in in the process of researching for this episode, there is not a great resource, which is surprising, on arm training. And I think that we can really provide some great information today. Yeah, absolutely, man. I'm looking forward to doing this with you. Absolutely. So my first question for you is that as you have been navigating your bodybuilding journey, what was that aha moment for you when you were training your arms to to start to see real progress? Did you Can you recall that time where uh, it really clicked for you? Sure. Yeah, great question. Um, so when I first started training, I had a really good like mind muscle connection with my biceps, but never had a good connection with my triceps. And I had really good bicep development, like from the get go. Um, obviously the majority of that is just genetic and shout out to my dad for the the shape and the insertion points and stuff. Um, but I always really struggled with tricep training. And the biggest thing that I had like an aha moment with in regards to tricep training specifically was utilizing movements that actually stabilized my GH joint, my glenohumeral joint. So making sure that upper arm was locked into place somehow. Um, And then it usually came from machine-based things where I had like an external pad to brace on or even utilizing a cable column and making sure that that upper arm was locked into place. Um, Once I started performing movements like that, I felt like my tricep training really, really took off. And then I got to a point where like there wasn't as much of a discrepancy personally between bicep development and tricep development. But yeah, that was a, a big aha moment for me for sure. I love that. On the topic of triceps, what are the top three or your favorite three tricep exercises? Um, so yeah, when it comes to the triceps, I like doing things that just vary shoulder angle, right? So I'll definitely mention like one movement that's going to be more shortened bias, one movement that's kind of more mid-range-ish, and then one movement that's more lengthened. So if I had to go with, I'm going to give you more than three movements, <laughs> that's but okay. it is what it is. So like if I'm talking shortened bias, um, I personally like cable kickbacks quite a bit. Um, I also like some sort of like single arm tricep pushdown. Um, and then maybe doing some shoulder extension at the end of the elbow extension, kind of like breaking it up into two movements. Mm. So we'll say that's like option number one. Okay. Um, and then option number two can be like a, a tricep push down. That's you're, you're using a little bit of, um, I don't want to say momentum, but you're allowing your torso angle to change a bit. And rather than having your elbows right by your rib cage, maybe your elbows are slightly out in front of you and you're doing a push down variation. But my favorite like mid range ish movement is those tricep extension mach- machines where it's basically the opposite of a preacher curl and your upper arm is kind of locked into place. You're able to get 
a real good amount of elbow flexion and a real nice stretch on the tricep at the top under load and then full extension. So I like that for mid-range based movements. And then for overhead machines um, or overhead movement or length and bias stuff, I have a really good machine at my local LA Fitness. Um, I believe it's by Nautilus. You're kind of like maybe you're at around like 110 degrees of shoulder flexion and it's single arm based. You're, you're locked in. You have the external stabilization. That's a good one. Um, or any sort of overhead cable extension is like my go-tos. I'm with you on that. I, the, um, the opposite of the preacher curl, there's a, a cable variation. I think that Cassim may have more popularized. I don't know if he necessarily came up with it, but that variation of it, of the cables being like right at your, like we'll call it right under your ear. And then they're kind of like running across your trap and then being able to extend at the elbow is one of my favorites as well. I, I, I really enjoy that exercise. Um, on the coming back to the the aha moments as you as you work with clients and and students in the in the classroom mm. do you find that their aha moment may have been similar to the one that you experienced within arm training do you find that they're maybe struggling the most with with triceps as well or maybe is it biceps are there a a commonality amongst the things that you see uh, for your clients or your students yeah um in regards to arms i feel like it's kind of like a 50 50 thing but i i do think most people either connect better with their triceps or connect better with their biceps i don't really see it too often where somebody has like a great connection with both i feel like there usually is some sort of bias there or like preference um some of the things that allow them to just improve their training it's it's the basics man it's slowing things down understanding what the intention of the movement is, what's actually happening here. Um, a lot of that stuff goes a super long way, right? So pausing at the end ranges of the motion, not using momentum to get out of the hole or whatever it may be on, on any movement. A lot of that stuff goes a really long way. Um, but yeah, when it comes, I mean, the, to me, bicep and tricep training is really, really simple. So if you can't fix it relatively quickly, um, you probably need to start asking bigger questions than like, <laughs> what the heck's going on here? To me, it's, you know, it's fairly, fairly simple. And if I do work with a client once in a blue moon in person or have a training partner, I feel like these are things that we can fix like in one session and they can kind of just carry that on with them, like moving forward. I agree. It With bicep and tricep training, it is just a matter of simplifying it. If there was a most common mistake to me, it is that, people are trying to overcomplicate of, I want to hit my short head or my long head of my bicep. And it, they're not really in a stage where it's like, we need to prioritize a particular portion of the bicep. And the same thing goes with the tricep. Do you have other common mistakes that you see, uh, whether it be on social or it be clients? Yeah. Um, to touch on like the point you're making people overcomplicating it, if you're having trouble with your bicep and tricep training at the moment, you probably shouldn't add more exercise variety and throw in more tools into your toolbox. You probably need to master how to use the tools you currently have. And that should just be super basic stuff. So like a, a single arm dumbbell bicep curl or a single arm cable curl with your shoulder right by your side, your shoulder at zero degrees. Um, if you can't get a really good connection on that movement, you probably shouldn't be doing something more complex. Um, and then same thing with triceps, right? Like if you don't get a good tricep contraction out of a, a single arm pushdown, you probably don't need to be doing like a dumbbell skull crusher coming across your body to try to hit your lateral head or something, right? Um, so yeah, just simplifying it and just understanding like, all right, what's the function of this muscle group? How does it change? How does the length change based on the shoulder position? Um, and what sort of sensations might feel different from movement to movement? So like a tricep push down is going to feel drastically different than an overhead dumbbell extension. And just kind of just being aware as to why that is, that can be beneficial. Um, but yeah, those are just some, some thoughts. I would add of 
being aware that everyone's shoulder mobility is going to be different. So if you feel as though that someone's able to get into a better position in an overhead exercise and you're like, I don't feel like I can get there, it may be an issue with your mobility to get in that position. And so you may be a little bit more set up differently, if you will. Um, yeah. So that's you know something to be mindful of because I can understand the person who's just taking Instagram or videos from YouTube and seeing this as the one example, it's like, I'm trying to follow this to a T and they may not be able to find themselves in that same spot. So just being uh, aware of that. Yeah, for sure. So like going off of that point, you know, if somebody has a hard time doing something between 110 degrees of flexion and all the way up to like 140 plus, um, you're still getting a great tricep stretch if you're just doing like a skull crusher or anything at like 90 degrees of shoulder flexion. So like you don't have to do something super overhead as long as you can get to 90 and do movements in this plane. Like that's still a good amount of stretch on that long head. So nothing to like be overly concerned about. With a majority of our conversation thus far being centered around triceps, would you, would you say that triceps to have big meaty arms would you say that triceps are the most important muscle group to train of the of the three? Oh yeah i would i would say so for sure um they're just a larger muscle group they're going to take up more you know a total area in terms of a circumference measurement and stuff like that so for sure um and then uh, you know shape individual genetic differences there's a lot of that we can't control but a lot of people kind of over focus if like somebody has like a, a a relatively weak lateral head like can you do movements that bias that lateral head a, a little bit more sure but is that going to drastically change how your tricep looks um i think those things are are a bit more minor you know it can it can make a drastic difference for like a physique competitor but like if somebody just wants bigger arms i don't think they need to get overly concerned in the minutia it's just like all right let's progressively overload our arm training over a long period of time. And it can be super simple. So speaking to that, how would you structure the program design if someone's coming to you and wanting to grow their arms? Let's call it a eight, 12 week phase, however you want to look at it. How would you structure the frequency? And is there a starting point within sets that you would be looking at? I know there's more nuance and, and certainly share as much nuance as you would like and kind of detailing what you would do. For sure. Um, yeah. So if somebody really wanted to bring up their arms, I would basically ensure that they're training arms twice per week for sure. Um, like biceps and triceps separately twice per week. Um, in terms of volume, I think doing six working sets for each of those muscles is plenty for one session. So like I personally love doing two working sets for three different movements when I am training like arms intentionally and it's not like an accessory thought. Um, so just as an example, like I used the um, the triceps before in terms of, okay, you have a push down, you have something in this mid range and then you have an overhead. I would do three variants of two sets of so six total working sets there. And then same thing for biceps. Maybe I'd start with something in a shortened position, do something in the mid range and then do something in the length. And so I think six working sets is plenty, 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 plenty for one training session. Um, so that would put you at like 12 working sets per week. Um, and then if somebody feels like they recover super, super well from those 12 traditional working sets split up in two sessions, maybe you throw in BFR arms on a third day. Hmm. And that's literally just one exercise for bicep one exercise for tricep supersetted literally would take them like four to five minutes total um, but it would be like one more hit of a growth stimulus that they would get on a weekly basis so that's an option um, another thing i personally love doing for people who struggle with their arms a lot of people run just like push pull leg splits and stuff like that i love have uh, i love having people hit chest and biceps together and back and triceps together um, me personally, when I do triceps at the end of my push session, um, I'm not getting nearly as much out of them. The stimulus that I'm getting there is going to be way, way lower compared to if I did triceps first in that session, or if I just put them on my pull day when they weren't affected from all the compound movements I, I was doing. So 
that's something I, I get a really good benefit from and something I've actually been doing recently myself. So I, I've paired back with my triceps and um, after my pushing my, my chest and shoulder work, I threw in literally just one exercise of biceps, but I get more out of that than doing multiple exercises at the end of a pole day and I'm already shot. So something to consider. So to go back to the, the BFR training, could you give the listeners greater context on how, like what that is and, and how to implement it? Yeah. So blood flow restriction training, um, it originated more in the physical therapy space and then kind of was adopted by, you know, bodybuilders or like those seeking more hypertrophy. Um, but essentially you are going to utilize either like knee wraps or like a BFR band or a strap, like an occlusion strap to the upper arm, like right underneath the deltoid. Um, and what that is going to do, you're still going to get blood flow going to the muscle, but it's going to significantly limit venous return. So you're going to get a lot more blood accumulated within that muscle tissue. You're going to get a really good pump in a short period of time. And a lot of those metabolites build up pretty rapidly. Um, but when you're doing BFR training, you're using really light loads. It's usually in the literature, they say about 30% of your one RM. Nobody knows your one RM for a bicep and tricep right. movement. So I tell most people it's about 50% of what you would normally lift. So if you normally curl a 25 pound dumbbell, then maybe you're just using 12 and a half or 15 ish pounds. Um, so around 50% of your normal working loads and the traditional way to do it is four sets. The first set is 30 reps and then the sets two through four or the next three sets are 15 reps. Um, the goal there too, isn't like you don't have to hit task failure. You don't have to feel like that was an RPE of 10. Or like you don't have to feel like you had zero to two RIR left on those sets. It's more about driving a lot of blood into the muscle and kind of trapping it there. Um, so it's a different kind of stimulus. You still do recruit a ton of muscle, like motor re unit recruitment is going to go through the roof towards the end of those sets. Um, so it's a different stimulus. It's not nearly as fatiguing because you're using lighter loads. It's easier on the joints because you're using lighter loads. So it's a nice little thing that people can sprinkle in for their arm training if it's truly a, a weak point. Um, and then I actually have a lot of people do that with their legs, but we will stay off of that. You know? So <laughs> yeah. if somebody normally hits legs twice per week, maybe they're throwing in BFR um, for a third time, but you're just doing like three to four sets of leg extensions and hamstring curls and you're done. So it's not like centrally fatiguing. It's not going to like impact your recovery for the entire week, but you're still getting like another hit of the stimulus um for your for growth over the course of the week okay i, I like how you're implementing that it, it sounds like a much better approach if you're going to have a, a third session or a third day that you're training a particular muscle because i've always found that if you're training a muscle three times in a week it's very tough to have adequate recovery by that third session and having the proper exercise selection in sessions one and two to make those sessions productive, but also allow for you to recover by that third. Totally agree. Totally agree. Um, something I've actually seen by implementing this, it seems like it almost enhances recovery because you're driving so much blood into that tissue and you're selecting movements that are not eccentric dominant at all. So like you're not doing RDLs, um, I'm not even going to do a seated hamstring curl. I'm going to do like a lying hamstring curl. I'm going to do a leg extension or for arms. Um, I would do something like a shortened bias bicep curl and a, a tricep push down. I'm not going to do an overhead thing or something with my shoulder extended. So yeah, stuff that's not going to create a lot of muscle damage that, that eccentric or that lengthened portion of the range isn't overloaded. Um, and you're just driving a bunch of blood there you're not going to zero RIR or whatever. You're kind of just calling these sets at 15 reps, getting the blood in there and, and finishing it. So yeah, it's a cool little tool in the toolbox. But again, I think the majority of people need to learn how to master the tools they're currently working with before implementing new tools. Yes. But I, the new tools is the, the shiny object <laughs> syndrome that gets everyone excited. It's like, oh, I haven't done that. Let me add it in. Right. It's like, no, like, let's get really good at what you currently have in and let's improve what you currently have in um, so you can get the most out of it. 
Absolutely. Low reps is best. High reps is best. Fruit is so it's good. It's terrible. You should you. lift heavy. High reps, Carbs low are needed. Keto squats are bad for your Squats are great. You for should squat astrographs. It's fine. It fits my macros. For idiots. When there are so many mixed messages going around, it's hard to know what you should even do or focus on. But that's exactly where physique development one-on-one coaching comes in. You might have heard of online coaching or even hired a coach before, but we believe in teaching you the why behind what we do while truly taking your life into consideration. We want to train, educate, and empower you to reach your goals and help you to stop spinning your wheels and just finally feel good. And hey, we're here to help you look good too. You need you. Your health is your wealth. So join Physique Development and let us be the last coach you ever need. You talked on it a little bit. Uh, How do you go about training intensity or um, scoring RIR goals within your arm training? Do you just always take it to failure? Do you have numbers that you're looking at with arm training specifically? Yeah. So for me, I'm like a terrible example to use (laughs) because I can do three sets of biceps a week and absolutely maintain like all my tissue there and maybe even grow slowly, like super slowly over time. Um, So I'm not a good example there. But in terms of intensity, I think for most people, they should be going really close to concentric failure because with these isolation movements, they're not going to impact your recovery for the entire week or negatively impact your performance on your other movements. So um, I think people should be taking these to the house. And if they do, they can do less total volume for the session. Um, Again, like for me, if I do two really good sets close to task failure, what's the point of me doing that third or fourth set? Like, it's kind of like I'm just hammering that muscle further and further, but is it really providing me with more growth or am I potentially creating like more muscle protein breakdown, digging myself into a larger ditch, and then I need more recovery, like nutrients and factors that I may not have. So um, I think people need to just improve the quality of what they're doing before they start doing more and more and more of it. I could not agree more. It is probably one of the largest mistakes that I made when I first started training is that I would do like the Rich Piana, Greg Plitt arm sessions and just had a copious amount of volume with the the goal of having the craziest pump ever. Whereas now, now obviously my strength has improved and those different things, but now I'm in a similar camp to you where two sets of getting close to, to concentric failure or getting to concentric failure is significant enough for me to maintain my bicep and tricep um, muscle tissue, if not maybe a little bit of gain over time and, and being consistent with it. So it's, it's an interesting interesting different uh, perspective. Yeah, for sure. I remember when I was uh, like a senior in high school or even like freshman in college, my my boys would pull up a workout from T Nation. They're like, bro, we got to do the thousand rep arm workout today. (laughs) (laughs) And even back then, I would say, I don't I don't think that's like a good idea or like that's necessary. But my buddies would do it. And it would just be like, who knows, maybe 25 working sets of just like you know, Something super, crazy. super, super, super like, yeah, oh, I've never been so sore in my arms before. I'm like, yeah, no shit. That'd be like, <laughs> that'd be like me running like 10 miles tomorrow and be surprised that my legs are sore. Exactly. Yeah. The, uh, the craziest thing that comes to my head right now is that, uh, there's probably a video on YouTube from like 2010 or 2011 that, um, uh, we were doing supersets of a easy bar cable curl for 10 sets of 10. And then we would lay down on the bench and do a easy bar skull crusher for 10 sets of 10 nice. and just go back and forth. And it was terrible and very yeah, unnecessary, yeah. but the pump was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Right. That's the GVT arms. Oh yeah. Super set. That's dope. That's dope. Uh, speaking of, of supersets, how do you like using interset, uh, variables with, with arm training supersets, drop sets, anything of the kind, do you like to implement those for arm growth? Yeah. I love pairing biceps and triceps back to back if that's how it's programmed in the split. So, you know, sometimes somebody might have like a shoulder and arm day. Okay, cool. Um, some people might even just have a full upper body day and then maybe towards the end of that session after doing their compounds, they're hitting bicep, tricep back and forth. Cool. Um, the only times I don't superset bicep and triceps is like 
if it was again a push day where I'm just doing tricep training or if it was like a chest shoulder bicep day then I'm not doing direct tricep work um but yeah I think that's super beneficial I think it's very very time efficient um the only constraint that pops up on a semi regular basis is if the commercial gym is busy and you just can't go back and forth between machines like that's usually like the number one complaint that I get if it's programmed in but I think it's super super time efficient um in terms of paired you know agonistic antagonistic sets I think that works really well um other like advanced techniques uh, I use for arms once in the blue moon I do intraset stretching on triceps um specifically on that machine we already spoke about like the opposite of the preacher curl um absolutely love that on that machine but I don't do too much intensity technique work at all um every once in a while I'll do like a run the rack on the dumbbell thing because again it's just like time efficient it's like okay that's the last working set I'm just going to go from 45s to 30s to 20s and call it a day right like got a great pump great stimulus and I'm out of the gym um I really don't think that stuff is necessary for again 95% of the listeners probably um but it can make your training more fun um and it is like a novel stimulus that if you're not you know necessarily getting sore on a regular basis or whatever if you sprinkle those in from time to time it probably will cause uh additional soreness that you might not experience on a on a regular basis and that can be good from time to time um to also get an idea of like what your recovery capabilities are and you kind of know like all right what's a little bit too much what may be a little bit too little um so i think they're good to to throw in for fun but is it actually needed for growth probably not you know just get better at the lifts you're doing <laughs> progressively overload them over time and good things will happen do you use any of the same muscle group pairings maybe like a tricep push down with a tricep extension overhead or something along, along those lines i i don't at the moment man and uh i don't even recall if i've ever done that in the past the only uh the only supersets i can genuinely think of right now is this is just coming to my mind i have done like a a reverse easy bar curl mm mm-hmm. And then once I'm completely shot on that, I would just supinate and then do bicep curls. Okay. Um but it's like okay, this first movement is really smashing my brachialis and brachioradialis. So I have a lot more left in the bicep and then go into a bicep movement, but it's like the load that you're lo- that you're using on that bicep movement isn't nearly as much load as it would be if you were doing it fresh. So Right. You know, am I just doing that for fun and to get a better pump or am I actually Do I actually believe this is causing more growth? Um so yeah, some things you just do because you enjoy it and because it feels good, you know. Um but yeah, I gen- I generally don't pair, you know, a tricep movement and a tricep movement or a bicep movement and a bicep movement, generally okay. speaking. One yeah. of the What about uh, you? Yeah, one of the pairings that I have used in the past is like a a high cable bicep curl for shortened and then going with like a behind uh like a, a lengthened bicep curl facing away from the cable. Just I don't know if it was necessarily for more growth, but if we're talking a hellacious pump and probably taking yeah. a little bit away from the strength in that lengthened bicep curl. Uh um, Sure. it was super fun so th- in in that yeah. sense it was a a blast and maybe more time efficient because it'd been the only exercises that i did for biceps that particular session the one that i'm thinking of now if you did them as straight sets would i have gotten more output from each of those because my performance if i was to do three sets in the in that pairing i'm sure that my performance dropped off set 2 set 3 and by set 3 i probably wasn't getting a whole lot out of it at that point after let's say i was doing 10 to 12 reps for each of those exercises it would have been i would have been thrashed by 2 easily sure sure no i i agree but i think it can be a good uh tool to utilize if time is like the main factor and right. you want to get in as much work in a short period of time i think that's an option um i've done a bunch of weird things in like hotel gyms or you know when traveling and like just trying to get the most stimulus in the shortest period of time i would do something like that yeah but would i program that if i knew time wasn't an issue and i'm trying to like cross all my t's and dot, my, dot all my eyes 
probably not, but that doesn't mean I'll never not do it. So, exactly. Um, yeah. Can you, uh, can you think of, it doesn't have to be arms related, but can you think of one of the more quirky things that you've done in a, a hotel gym? Um, good question. Um, hotel gyms, a lot of times, man, I do like giant sets. So like a massive circuit. So, okay. I'll do pull-ups, dips, lateral raises, tricep extension, bicep curl, repeat. Right. And just do like three rounds of that. And 15 minutes in, I'm like, all right, I'm done. <laughs> Gotta go. So like, it's just like a really quick, full upper body ish pump and call it a day kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so for for situations like that with limited equipment and super limited time, um, maybe I'm doing giant sets and even drop sets on that last one or whatever it may be. But um, nothing like came to my mind right away. Of like, oh, what's the craziest <laughs> something silly hotel gym thing I've done? Yeah, <laughs> I uh, with with hotel gyms, I always look at it as I have generally up to fifty pound dumbbells. If I'm really lucky, I have cables and then it's just like, how can I make the 50 pound dumbbells as challenging as possible? And then kind of just like creating a giant set around that. Yeah. So we're, we're on the same page for that, for sure. Yeah. Um, we, we haven't spent a whole lot of time on, on biceps. I feel like we've spent more time on triceps, which makes sense of what we talked about of it being a larger portion of the arm. Do you have a, a top three favorite bicep movements? Top three bicep movements. So again, me personally, any bicep movement I do feels great. Like oh, great connection, awesome stimulus, almost honestly doesn't matter. Um, if I had to go with three bicep movements that I love, I would say it's again, a machine preacher curl. Um, I love a single arm standing cable curl. Just my shoulder at zero degrees. It feels great. With the cable in front of you or the cable behind you? Uh, both, both. But okay. If I'm trying to do like a, like a true, like zero degree, like mid ish range movement, then I'll have the cable in front of me. And I almost feel like as I'm doing my eccentric, I'm not thinking about just allowing the elbow to flex, but I'm also trying to think about my forearm going further away from my body. So almost like creating an arc. So if there's a wall in front of me here, it's like, I'm trying to get this fingertip to like hit that wall rather than just like drop straight down. Does that make sense? That makes sense. It's really, yeah, great cue. Yeah. So like when I, when I'm doing the eccentric and I'm extending at the elbow and I'm lengthening the bicep, I'm trying to like, I'm almost visualizing and I'm trying to feel like my wrist and my hand is getting further away from my elbow. Um, even though the length of my forearm clearly is not changing, there's no change in the moment arm, but it's just like a visualization uh, to go through that. That just like makes me connect super well with my bicep. And um, again, as I'm performing flexion, rather than just thinking of like lifting it straight up, I'm almost thinking about like creating an arc. Does that make sense as performing it? But yeah, any, any bicep movement works well for me, man. So uh, preacher curl machine, single arm standing cable and then um either a dumbbell incline uh cable uh dumbbell incline curl in the lengthened position or a uh cable curl with the shoulder extended all of those work really well for me absolutely i, I would have to agree we're agreeing on many things through this episode yeah. <laughs> but those are my three favorites i would say so it's going back to what i mentioned uh initially i had terrible mind muscle connection with my tricep uh, initially and um I needed external stabilization on my tricep movements. I never felt the need for that on my bicep movement. So I can do dumbbell work. I can do cable work without that upper arm braced or stabilized at all. And I still just can lock in. Um, whereas with the tricep stuff, having a machine or some sort of external brace helped a lot. Mm. Um, so maybe some of the listeners, if you struggle with tricep training, try to do movements that stabilize your upper arm or maybe if you struggle with bicep training get away from movements that don't have stabilization and then pick a machine that does stabilize that upper arm i think that's fair with um with forearms do you program anything specific for forearm training super simple i always program forearm training especially for my physique competitors i think it's a commonly neglected muscle group but I keep it super simple. Uh, most people are doing some sort of reverse curl. It's usually with an easy bar. And then I'm having them do um, just 
wrist flexion for direct forearm work as well. Uh, sometimes they're just using a straight bar, getting it full extension, full flexion, really simple stuff. And for that, obviously, you can focus on progressively overloading and treating it just like every other muscle group. But I think for so many people, as long as it's programmed in and you're doing 12 to 20 reps close to concentric failure, you are going to get some sort of growth stimulus because most people don't do any direct forearm training at all. So just throwing it in um, and not overthinking it usually leads to some positive growth right off the bat because your baseline is almost zero, right? You've just done indirect work from grabbing weights with as much uh, force as possible or intensity. But yeah, it's, it's really, really simple. I don't do anything too complex. Um, if you want to consider hammer curls as well, like a forearm-ish exercise, hammer curls are very commonly programmed in for my athletes as well. Okay. I, I'm i with you on the forearm training. Have you seen the, like, they'll, they'll have like a, a plate at the bottom and then you're doing the, the wrist curls? Yes. What, what are your thoughts yes. on that? Um, so I used to do that when I was in Kung Fu from like the ages of like eight to 14. Um, so I almost have like PTSD in my Sifu, <laughs> like forcing us to do a bunch of crazy shit. Um, I think that's great. Maybe for like grip strength. I also remember like in, in high school, a lot of the, the wrestlers were doing that. Mm -hmm. Like the strength and conditioning coach would make the, the high school wrestlers do it. And also like towel pull-ups, yep. like sh just for like grip strength. Um, I mean, theoretically, it should build your flexors and your extensors to, to a degree. Um, there's probably slightly more efficient ways to train it. But again, if you're doing zero forearm work and you throw that one thing in, you're going to get some forearm growth for sure. I, uh, I, I bring it up because I did it so much growing up. It was like part of my nighttime routine for okay. it's from my dad. So he had homemade one and it was like a just rope on a cutoff um broomstick and he put yeah. the rope through the broomstick <laughs> and then had a old Folgers coffee container those like tin okay. ones and he filled that with cement and then the, the oh, rope wow. went in there and so I would have to do those every night literally every night uh with it, it changed as I got older for my pushups. So I had to do a number of pushups and then I had to do at least five of those wrist curls. And that obviously ascended as I got older as well. Um, yeah. and so I just, I laugh now cause I have a, a nicer one as more of like a playful joke to my dad. I'll send him videos of me using it now. And I'm like, still, still doing it. Yeah. And, uh, he's always <laughs> saying like, make sure your clients know that I, I'm the one that got you on that. Um, so I get a, a good laugh at it. I'm not so sure it's going to be putting on all this muscle tissue onto your forearms. Um, but I, I do find that maybe grip strength being the, the big improvement if there there was something in it especially if you're doing them continuously of being able to continue to hold on to it as your forearms fatigue for sure for sure yeah that's funny you mentioned that you had some exercises that you kind of like religiously did oh, before yeah. going to sleep or something uh gave me some uh some memories flooded into my brain for sure yeah. i used to do uh i used to do calf races on my stairs really? every night before going to bed yeah i wish um, i had done that because i i used to love basketball and Everyone thought that you would be a good jumper if you just trained calves, not glutes, hamstrings, and quads, just calves. All you need <laughs> is the strong calf. So I would do a bunch of toe raises when I was younger, uh, at least a hundred every night before going to sleep. Do you feel like it made a difference? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I have pretty good calves for natural bodybuilding competitors and I don't really, I don't really train them for like progression. I kind of just like maintain what I have and they can, they can absolutely like be better but like they're they're a good muscle group on me and i think it was it was from doing all that when i was way younger okay i like that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's crazy just kind of how you just do those habitually and, and hopefully it comes around but at, in time it obviously pays off yeah it's funny <laughs> very interesting are you sick and tired of your glutes not growing turning around in the mirror and seeing a board for a booty. I've been coaching for nearly a decade, helping thousands of women reach their goals. The most common goal, grow my glutes. Women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s able to grow their glutes 
with the guidance of my training programs. And for all this time, I've kept my best glute growth secrets only for my one-on-one clients. And that changes today. We just released our 12-week glute growth program in the PD training app. It is a four-day program with exercise and volume adjustments every three weeks. You can easily access the program through our app and track every single workout. Each exercise will have a detailed video teaching you exactly how to perform each and every movement. And guess what? I am no longer gatekeeping. I'm sharing every single one of my best glute growth secrets inside this program because you are awesome and I want you to have this program. I'm going to give you $25 off, making it a fraction of what you spent at Starbucks this past month. Use code POD. The link to purchase will be in the description. Now let's get back to the show. I've, I've talked about it a little bit with, with your students earlier in the episode, but, um, you do great research and I was curious of any current research that you are digging into at the university. Yeah. Um, I'm going to backtrack super quick because just because we, it's going to be about research, but my first research project, uh, ever as primary investigator, first author was a bicep study. Oh, really? Um, so we can, yeah, we can quickly touch on that. Um, the title of it is something along the lines of the effects of varying glenohumeral joint angle on biceps, muscle activation, uh, training volume and like echo intensity or strain. So super long story short, um, it was an acute study. We had two groups, um, we had two conditions. So all the participants did both conditions and, uh, one day they came into the lab and they did nine sets of bicep curls with their shoulder at zero degrees on a cable column um, with an electromyography sensor on their bicep. And we also did pre and post muscle thickness assessments to see how much cell swelling or how much of a pump the subjects got. And then with that ultrasound image, we also did an echo intensity measurement, which is looking at like how the color of the image is changing. And what that tells us is how much fluid has accumulated in there and how much strain has potentially occurred. Um, I'm going to keep it simple. So (laughs) that was day one. They just did nine sets with their shoulder at zero. Um, Condition two or day two, the subjects came in and they did three sets with their shoulder at 90 degrees, um, three sets with their shoulder at zero degrees, and then three sets with their shoulder at negative 15 degrees, so shoulder extension. Um, And what we found was that second condition that varied their shoulder position it led to significantly greater um, muscle activation across those nine total sets, despite volume load being exactly the same. Um, and we didn't even control for volume load. Um, we controlled for intensity. So they were working with, um, I believe it was around you know 80% of their 10 rep maxes that we found in each of those positions. Um, but what that essentially shows is like they're like all volume isn't created equal and there is like more effective volume. And we also found that in the distal bicep closer to the elbow joint, um, there was more like muscle strain that we found in that group that varied. And it was most likely from the, the shoulder extended position that put that bicep in a lengthened position. And then about three years later, a group out of um, Brazil did a chronic study that was eight to 10 weeks long. And they had one group, both groups trained three days per week, and it was a full, full body workout. Um, but one group was doing just standing bicep curls with a dumbbell with their shoulder at zero degrees. The other group was doing a preacher curl one day, a standing bicep curl on Wednesday or the second day, and then a dumbbell incline curl on the third day. And they found significantly greater growth over that eight week period. Um, I believe it was around 28% greater growth wow. in the group that varied. And the coolest thing about that chronic study was the group that did the zero degree curl uh, with their shoulder in that neutral position, they grew from pre to post significantly, but only the group that varied their shoulder angle found growth at the proximal bicep, the medial portion of the bicep and the distal bicep. So it really alluded to how important exercise variety and selection can be to creating better growth across the entirety of a muscle. Um, And that was shown earlier in the lower body by Fonseca and colleagues that varied exercises in the legs. So 
they had multiple conditions. They had four conditions, but long story short there, two out of the four conditions were just doing squats. And then the other two out of the four conditions were doing squats, leg press, lunges, and deadlifts. And only the group that varied their exercise selection significantly grew all four heads of the quad, whereas the group that just did squats only grew their vastus lateralis and their rectus femoris significantly. Hmm. The VI and the VMO didn't, didn't significantly grow. So it just points in the direction that, okay, exercise selection is super, super important. Um, going back to what you said before, like you have a video of you doing 10 sets of GBT skull crushers and 10 sets of bicep curls, we'd probably be better off doing four sets of one exercise, three sets and three sets of another and still getting the same 10 sets. Um, so I just wanted to share that. But yeah, in regards to research right now, um, there's like four manuscripts being worked on in the background. Um, one is a, a lat training study. Um, we simply compared a shoulder extension based pull down. So the upper arm staying close to the rib cage compared to a shoulder adduction based pull down on how that impacts lat activation, um, Terry's major posterior deltoid and bicep. And then if there, if there is any significant changes in cell swelling at different regions of the lat, so like was one more thoracic lat or one more, you know, iliac lat ish, um, we're still working on that because there's some complications with just analyzing all of that stuff. Um, we're still trying to figure out like what the best way to, to do this. Um, so some complications there, but that's one study that's in the works. Um, we have another study that's really cool. It's by my buddy, Josh Bradshaw. He's the one who is going to be the first author there. Um, it's on myo reps. So that's coming out soon. We're in the revision process right now. Um, another study on training volume that is really, really cool, has a really unique design. Um, and I'm also working on a meta analysis for the first time with, uh, Dr. Brandon Roberts and a bunch of colleagues. Like there might be like 14 plus authors on that paper. There's a lot of people working on it. Yeah. We have to go through over 7,000 abstracts to see what qualifies as inclusion or exclusion criteria. So we can meta analyze it. So, um, yeah, it's a lot of work, man. This stuff takes oh, so much time. That's, that was going to be my first question was how long, I mean, all, all those are different, but what would be kind of the average length of time from start to finish do, do the studies take? An absolute minimum from what I've been a part of in terms of randomized control trials. It's usually an absolute minimum of 12 months. I would say the average is closer to 18 months. And then we're like a lot of the people that I work with where we don't rush our work. Like we're okay with taking time with it because once it's published, it's published. There's no going back. There's no change in stuff. So, you know, a lot of times it takes about two years, man, from, from start to finish, sometimes longer from like conception to writing out the IRB, getting it approved by the university, then doing, um, recruitment for subjects, then actually doing the data collection, then doing the data analyses, and then writing the manuscript. It takes a lot. And when you have multiple co-authors, you know, you want everybody to sign off on certain steps. And it's a lot of work, man. It's a lot of work. Yeah, it sounds like it. Is any of those four, which one's the furthest along? Uh, the volume paper is by far the furthest along. It's it's complete. Um, we're just waiting on the peer review from the journal at this point. Is there is there more to share on that one in terms of of training volume specifically? Yeah. So I'll, I'll, what I'd like to share about it, the coolest thing in my opinion, is all the previous volume research generally allocates a subject to a specific volume group. So. I've been a part of volume studies in the past. And as an example, um, we looked at 12 weekly sets, 18 weekly sets, and 24 weekly sets on lower body training. And we knew how many sets per week the subjects were doing before entering the study. And we randomized them based on that. So we tried to like equally allocate subjects to the, the 12 set group, the 18 set group, the 24 set group. However, there, there's still some potential flaws there. Like, if somebody was previously doing 24 sets per week and now they're in the 12 set per week 
group, if they don't grow much at all, or they just maintain, that might just be because they're used to way more volume. Whereas if someone's used to doing 12 sets per week and we throw them in a 24 set per week group, maybe they don't grow well either because maybe it was too much volume and now they're overworked. So that's how all the research has previously been done. They've just like allocated these subjects into different groups, depending on the parameters that those authors like previously set. What this study is, we still have three groups, but what we have is we have a control group where they did the same amount of volume in our lab than they were previously doing outside of our lab before the commencement of the study. So we have one group is the control group that's just matching the same weekly set volume. We have one group that increased their set volume by 30%. So in that same group, you might have some subjects doing eight sets per week and some subjects doing 20 sets per week, depending on what their previous baseline was. And then our third group was doing a 60% increase from their baseline. So I think this is a phenomenal study design. Um, I think it has a little bit more like practical application to some degrees. And to me, it addresses a pretty large potential issue with the previous volume data. Mm -hmm. Some researchers completely disagree and say previous set volume doesn't have an impact on how somebody's going to grow and respond. But a lot of practitioners in the field might not necessarily agree with that at all. Mm -hmm. So it's it's interesting. Um, it's kind of crazy to me that like it's still such a, it, it kind of is a, a hot topic or volume is still discussed and debated quite a bit. Um, but yeah, that's that project should be out very, very soon. If I had to guess in the next four to 12 weeks, it'll probably be published. Mm. What was the, if you can recall, was the the highest amount of sets someone was doing before they started the study? Um, that's a great question. I think the highest amount was around 24 weekly sets or so. Yeah. So I guess if they were pushed into the the 60% group, they'd be cranking through some real volume in the lab. <laughs> yeah. I remember one subject, his sessions were taking like two and a half, three hours. He was just in the oh lab gosh. for like, yeah. Yeah. And it's brutal because our equipment is limited, right? So we're doing barbell back squat, leg press, leg extension. We also had them doing, um, GHRs for, for hamstring, but everyone's hamstring volume was like the same. Cause we weren't doing a direct measurement of the hamstring anyway. We're doing direct measurements of quads. But, uh, yeah, I remember this one subject he was doing maybe eight sets of leg press, like every session. Mm. It's like, uh, God bless your soul. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All at like, you know, two RIR, that last one's the failure. Yeah. yeah. I hope he's eating. I hope rough. he's eating. I hope yeah. he's sleeping. I hope he's got everything <laughs> yeah. in check outside of the, yeah. outside of the gym. Um, yeah, it's tough. I appreciate you taking the time to, to chat today. It's been fantastic. Course, is there, man. is there one thing that you would leave the listeners with for their arm training, um, that they can take with them after the episode? Yeah. Uh, arm training. Again, find the exercises that you do have the best mind-muscle connection with. Hone in on progressing on those. The movements that you currently don't have a good mind-muscle connection with, try to figure out why that is. Um, see if you can do a very similar movement with potentially a different machine or a different apparatus that allows you to have a better mind-muscle connection. So super quick example um let's say somebody has a really poor mind muscle connection with a dumbbell incline curl right so a lengthened biased bicep movement um see if you can still get into that shoulder extended position on a different movement where you have a really really good connection so maybe it's the cable um, maybe you have that upper arm braced against something, or you're just changing your torso angle. So you still have shoulder extension against an external object and see if that would help you connect with that movement better. So that's one example. And then, you know, if we were to use triceps again, some people might not have a great, uh, mind muscle connection with like a dumbbell skull crusher or whatever it may be. But if you put them in that same exact shoulder position on a machine, they might feel their triceps firing throughout the entire range of motion super, super well. So 
yeah, just kind of ask yourself, like, why do I have a really good connection with this exercise, but a really poor connection with that exercise and see if you can improve it. Um, I would also tell people to try to keep their shoulder locked in place for a lot of these movements. Um, I don't want to go on a huge ramble now, but like <laughs> some people like doing skull, like skull crushers as like a two movement thing where they like getting as much of a stretch on that skull crusher. Um, I don't want to say like one way is right or wrong. I just want to share like my personal preference. When I have people do skull crushers, I like keeping their shoulders at 90 the entire movement and just focusing on the elbow movement, the elbow moving. And if they wanted to do something that is more, you know, length and biased or an even greater stretch, then just do a different movement. That's truly overhead. Um, I'm not a huge fan of like doing a shoulder movement and a, elbow movement at the same in the same exercise especially for someone who has a bad mind muscle connection um so for a lot of people if they can lock in their shoulder and their scapula and kind of just make sure nothing's moving except the elbow on any sort of bicep curl variant or any sort of tricep extension they're probably going to have a better mind muscle connection with less things moving so um yeah those are just some like suggestions keep it simple um, if you're not training arms twice per week, consider doing that. If you've always done your tricep work at the end of a push session, consider doing it first or consider just changing your split around a bit where maybe you're doing a shoulder and arm day rather than a push day and a pull day, or do your chest and shoulder work and then do biceps at the end rather than triceps. And then on your pull day, basically do all your back compound stuff and then do triceps at the end rather than biceps. Um, I think that alone would go a really long way. Um, there is no like clear right and wrong. So feel free to get creative and try something you haven't tried before, or simply try something that's not super mainstream or popular at the, at the moment within like the social media space, if it's going to align better with your personal goals and your personal needs at the moment. That's gold. Uh, that, that is, yeah, that was the whole episode basically consolidated plus some. So yeah. <laughs> there we go. Uh, can you let everyone know where to, where to find you and, uh, yeah, where they can find you? Yeah, for sure. Um, so on Instagram, it's just my full name. It's at Christopher dot Um, in regards to some of the research I do and some of my personal coaching stuff and everything like that, you can find information at schoolofgains.com and gains is spelled with the Z. Um, and that's really it. If you guys have any questions, feel free to shoot me a DM or shoot me an email or go to the website and contact me through the website, whatever is honestly convenient for you. Um, and yeah, I look forward to hearing from some of you guys. I appreciate you having me on, Alex. I hope that was uh, very insightful for some of the listeners. And yeah, feel free to you know, if you tried something that we discussed in today's episode and you want to share it with me, I'd be happy to hear about it. So hope you guys enjoyed this. And again, Alex, thank you for having me on, man. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for coming. And thank you guys for listening. We will see you in the next episode.